the same program, and as much as possible the same architectonic or typological logic. But then to reduce shadow in the public realm, what would that be like? And then we would pair that with a project that did the opposite of that, which is to think of the surface of the building as a site for energy uh, production. And these studies, again, I don't, I don't want to make great claims to them, but we're trying to build a way of understanding the problem in a deep way, to try to understand this kind of dialectic between energy production and shadow reduction. And we're using the fact that there is a literacy about Chicago buildings, and a literacy about these iconic buildings that we share. So we don't have to begin with describing the found condition. We all know what the Sears Tower was. And we built um, a couple of models. We did a kind of massing model of the entire loop in both directions. And we did a series of uh, maquettes. So these are kind of large um, robot arm foam wire cut maquettes um, at scale uh, as a field that you could kind of walk between and begin to understand this uh, alternative or counterfactual pair of histories and this trade-off that I think might be helpful in sharpening some of our work or some of our as a way to ask uh, maybe tougher questions about the urban arts and the work that we do. Um, as Alex mentioned, um, two and a half years ago, my colleague Mohsen Mustafavi and I founded a new uh, research unit at the GSD uh, that we call the Office uh, for Urbanization. Uh, so we're a little bit of a research startup, and I want to just start there to give you a context for the kind of work that we're doing and the con commitments that we're uh, bringing to bear. Uh, as you do, we sit in the context of one of the world's leading research universities, and often we're articulating What's the role of design in a place like this? How can we articulate the value of design as an activity in the context of a research university? In other contexts at other times, university presidents and provosts and a variety of other disciplines could look at the design arts and think of us as something like fashion, icing, frosting, something decorative that's added at the end if you have sufficient surplus capital left over after the primary work of the research university. This is a tendency that we're lucky that we don't see too much of uh, at Harvard these days uh, with the extraordinary leadership of Drew Faust and now Larry Bacow. But we began the Office of Urbanization two and a half years ago with this sense of needing to articulate why does design deserve its own epistemological framework? Why does design get its own university mandate? How do we produce knowledge through design? And in this regard, um, we began by rereading um, Herbert Simon. This is the Nobel Prize winning economist, political theorist. Uh, Simon uh, argued, among other things, a theory of bounded rationality, arguing that we tend to make economic decisions uh, less optimally than classical economic theory would allow, and more often based on our limited uh, wetware, our limited social and cultural formation, our human emotions. This is not quite behavioral economics. But in the 60s and 70s, Herbert Simon argued in his Sciences of the Artificial book an argument around the boundedness of our decision making. Simon argued that ultimately on a campus like yours, the sciences, the natural and ultimately the social sciences, are responsible for describing the world as it's found. Design, on the other hand, is responsible and concerned with how things ought to be. And I'm interested here in that question of ought, the ethical valence of how the world ought to be organized, both how it might be organized, but also the ethical sense of oughtness, the sense of what's appropriate or just. It's in that space um, that we do essentially a kind of applied design research. Um, our mission is to imagine alternative futures. It's our day-to-day -day work. Our business model is very simple. We work with governments, uh, we work with private foundations, occasionally philanthropists, and then we work on questions central to the future of the city. And we do this through imagining alternatives and in a kind of scenario-based planning that would be quite um, legible to people in this building. It would be quite obvious that these are the sensibilities and habits of an urbanist or a designer. Our vision ultimately is to try to reduce the time lag. We know that our students have enormous impact in the world as do yours. The challenge is waiting the decade or two and seeing them leave the academy and go to work in the private sector for that decade or two until that societal impact is evident. And so what we do is we hire some of our own graduates, maybe some of your graduates as well. We employ them as full-time staff, normalized labor relations, full-time health insurance benefits and the like. And we have a cohort now of seven full-time researchers working in this office with us, imagining alternative futures for cities uh, around the world. <laughs> 
we know that the challenges of the city rarely correspond to the disciplinary boundaries that we have, inhabit in the academy. And therefore, our work tends to transcend those and to build teams with various disciplinary and professional categories. We do this work under the general rubric of design research. I don't know where you are on the campus here at USC vis-a-vis -vis design research, but again, in returning to Simon, in his Sciences of the Artificial, Simon argued that design thought about in this way responsible for how the world ought to be, not just describing it as it's found, is not simply the core of design education. It's the core of what Simon argued was all professional training. So every professional across campus, whether they be in a school of medicine, education, or law, is essentially concerned with processes of design. And ultimately, um, you know, Simon goes further arguing for a kind of science of design that for me is, is a bridge too far in this context but that we could talk about. Of course, you are aware that there are references to design research and design thinking across campus through a variety of disciplines. At Harvard, we have a working group on design thinking. There are design thinking courses offered in every school across campus at Harvard. Most often, most and I and Michael Hayes, we go to these meetings and we say, thank you. We're much more comfortable talking about design research than we are design thinking. I personally stopped reading design thinking when the New York Times in 2015 had a piece about how design thinking might improve your dating life. I'll leave it to you to make your own judgments about this. But my point for you is that design as a valence, design as an activity that transcends the professional identities, but which is really ethically bound up in how the world ought to be organized, is really central to our thinking about the world uh, these days. And of course, you, um, in this august, you know, storied school, you know that design research is, by definition, uh, synthetic. We incorporate knowledge from a wide variety of sources and subject matter. Design research is equally characterized by our capacity to organize and aggregate a, a wide array of information. The way that we think about this is that at one point in time, every discipline on a campus like this used to draw, used to have engineers used to draw, medical doctors used to draw, maybe not lawyers, maybe not attorneys, but you take my point. And that those skill sets in the mathematical and the digital era have fallen to places like this School of Architecture or the Graduate School of Design, where we have inherited the development of cart cartographic skills and visual uh, infographics and a whole range of things. Design research, as you know, often works through simulations and scenario-based planning. So most often our futures are plural, they're never singular, and they're not always good things. They're most often projections of what might happen if we did nothing, a so-called scenario zero. The work of design research, as you know, is most often propositional by definition, right? If, if in four weeks' time at your final reviews, if there's not a proposition on the wall, where are we in a school of architecture, right? So it's more propositional than simply empirical or descriptive. And then finally, and this is maybe the most subtle and important point on a campus like this one or mine, the work that we do the knowledge that we produce in a school like this, these projects, these forms of knowledge stand simultaneously as propositions for intervention in the world, but equally as a form of knowledge that our disciplines produce. And that combination, that double valence in which we are producing knowledge about the world, and that's also the form of disciplinary knowledge in our field, is something that can often lead to confusion or lack of clarity across campus in which, in many proper disciplines, to intervene in the world is to somehow uh, breach one's ethical boundaries as an academic. This work that we do um, with partners around the world is uh, informing uh, of and informed by the teaching mission of the school. We do try to keep clear boundaries and be clear about what's teaching and what's research. But at the same moment, there's a, a set of relationships between them that we find uh, productive. It's my assertion for you this evening and my um, ambition over the next several years that I believe we're on the cusp of describing something, the language is not quite right, it'll take us a while, but something like a, a new heliomorphism. And I'm drawn to this formulation in part because the heliomorphic is a topic that is so done and dusty that it's impossible to imagine anything new. And of course, over the course of the next few minutes, I'll try to describe a, a history to the topic that suggests it's already been done. But at the same moment, I want to suggest to you, I believe I can prove to you over the course of 
the next 45 minutes or so um, that there is new work being done here. Um, when we opened our office for urbanization uh, two and a half years ago, we convened a conference. We're normally not convening events, but as a kind of moment to celebrate, we convened a conference where we brought together a range of architects and urbanists. Um, uh, we had keynotes by a number of really talented kind of leading practitioners. This is me uh, in a conversation with Jeannie Gang and Tom Main. Uh, and for reasons I'll make clear uh, in a moment, I thought they would be well positioned to be able to articulate uh, how their practices are embodying uh, Studio Gang and how morphosis are embodying this new heliomorphic uh, turn. A part of what appeals to me about the topic is it allows us to continue the ecological agenda, but in more precise spatial and formal terms. Another thing that appeals to me about the topic is that it has been so thoroughly developed and articulated over the course of centuries that it produces an enormous capacity for reflection on the history of these topics. Beginning with uh, British right to light laws in the 17th and 18th century, and continuing through the mythical origins of urban and city planning uh, in this country in the 19th century, the regulation of unfettered capital accumulation toward the effect of allowing us to have some modicum of air and light has been fundamental to the development of what we might call urbanism today, whether that be urban design or urban planning, uh, whether it was the 1916 zoning ordinance of New York or its equally significant inscription in cultural terms by Ferris in the 1920s. What appeals to me about the topic is its direct proximity to questions of social equity and a broad-based long durée sense in the West post-enlightenment that even though the city is a site of incredible intense capital accumulation and reproduction, we agree broadly to limit that capital reproduction so as to allow us access to light and air. Now that, that's very facile, it's very simplistic, I'm sorry, but for me that's really the foundation of why this is interesting. Of course, um, 1919, 2019, we we're in the centenary year of the founding of the Bauhaus, among other things. And of course, uh, these are drawings by Walter Gropius, 1929, uh, who, uh, of course, became the first chair of architecture at the GSD. If in the deep durée of modernism, the idea of access to light and air is deeply, deeply inscribed. Um, my, own, uh, my own particular... Um, uh, uh, kind of his historical uh, mentor has been Ludwig Hilbersheimer, the German city planner. And of course, Hilbersheimer's interest in these topics has been quite well uh, documented. In the second half of the 20th century, um, there's a history that's um, available, that's been written in certain parts. In that genealogy, you would, of course, include um, the work of Victor Oljay, the idea of design with climate, and a, 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 an extension from the technical side, a kind of interest in the kind of technology and thinking about climate at a global scale, which is, of course, very current for us today, all the way through up through the 1980s and something like Ken Frampton's critical regionalism, began to think about climate as a medium through which and we, for this purpose, we're going to set aside Bannum from even from that conversation, because there's much more to be said about Bannum. Ultimately, um, I think among the most interesting pieces of work done on the topic um, was done by a Canadian urbanist, a relatively obscure figure called Vladimir Mattis. Uh, Mattis used the term heliomorphic urban design in his 1988 Design for Northern Climates. Uh, this was, of course, at a moment when everyone was Mediterranean and we all, all we had to do was somehow understand the genius loci of our valley or understand the critical regional potential of a climate. And Mattis said, no, I'm working in Ontario. Like, we don't have any sunlight here. We really have to understand this in a serious way. And he did, a, I think, a, a fairly interesting uh, body of work uh, building upon the concept of solar envelope um, that was really pioneered uh, by your own Ralph Knowles. Um, it's, I think, important for me to acknowledge my own um, you know, intellectual and uh, academic indebtedness to Ralph Knowles. Uh, you all know him. He's your Ralph Knowles, Professor Emeritus at this institution. Um, he is also um, enjoying a kind of a kind of renaissance these days in the circles that I travel in. There are no fewer than a half a dozen academics on vari a variety of disciplines working on Ralph Knoll's projects. Now, I don't know precisely. I saw Ralph um, last year when I was out. He's in, he's in reasonably good health. He's, he's intellectually as sharp as ever. Um, and 
I believe that his really groundbreaking work uh, at USC on this concept of the solar envelope and the relationship between energy and form is as prescient and timely a topic as I can imagine. Um, now, I think I'm led to believe in some ways by, by Ralph himself, but also by some of the literature that you know his um, currency or the currency or the relative uh, value or impact of his, his work has, as it will for all of us, waxed and waned at certain moments historically. Um, and I do suggest that you know, there are limitations to recuperating a positivist or a purely technocratic approach. I don't want to suggest to you that we can simply return to science. But I do believe that both in his uh, MIT dissertation and then in his canonical energy and form publication, I think Knowles was getting at something absolutely fundamental at a very, very deep level. And if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to get a copy of his dissertation, which is it's one third ecological theory, one third systems theory, and, and, and one third a kind of Lynchian planning. It's really an extraordinary document, getting at the fundamental elements of energy, our relationship to the ground, and patterns of urbanization. Um, it was first through these kinds of diagrams uh, in which he and his students were, this is 1981, 1982, beginning to articulate a solar envelope which sits somewhere between a formal exploration on the one hand and something that was pure policy. This is another aspect of Knowles' work that I think is timely for us today, which is we tend to work and live in a culture in which our address to urban questions almost immediately becomes political on the one hand. If we had the right governor, if we had the right mayor, if we had the right reform, if we could elect the right representatives, if we could somehow affect an overturn of our economic system at that level, we could change the cities we live in. Or projects become an immediate singularity. It's Hudson Yards, it's Heatherwick, it's Zaha Hadid, right? And that culture that we live in, in which a project is immediately a singularity, it's the football stadium, it's the Olympic bid, or it's a more generalized problem of political economy, it precludes us from really talking in fundamental and meaningful ways about collective outcomes in urban form. And in these studies, I think Knowles was getting at something between spatial or formal studies and policy, in which the ecological driver of solar performance and its societal ethic underpinning are fundamental but unlike so much of the frothy fringe that I've enjoyed and have dined out on for two decades now in ecology, it's absolutely empirical. That combination of empiricism with societal ethic for me, I think Knowles understood. He understood it at a deep level mathematically, but also in terms of the human animal. If you haven't seen uh, this work, the work of the Heliodon or the work of these, um, of these studies, uh, this is work he was doing at MIT. He then had a sojourn in Alabama. He spent some time in Auburn a couple of years before being appointed uh, out here. I want to recommend to you um, a recent publication by my colleague Andrew Witt of the GSD uh, and our former student Chris Resnick. Um, this is a joint publication between the Canadian Center for Architecture and the GSD. It's an e-publication. It's available to be downloaded. And it's uh, one in a series of takes on what Andrew Witt refers to as design science or the sciences of design. And what Witt and his colleagues are doing is essentially applying frameworks and understandings from the history of science and technology studies, or STS, which are quite well established uh, across uh, universities these days, and applying them to the kind of uh, technological or uh, kind of positivist kind of design science studies from the middle of the 20th century. Um, in addition to a very, I think, persuasive argument about Knowles and the use of the studio here to study conditions of ecology and solar performance, uh, what Witt and Resnick, and in my own modest way I'm trying to contribute to, is a recuperation of what was here known as the natural forces laboratory. Right, so that idea of a lab, a university unit under the rubric of natural forces in which student work, a combination of applied uh, research and engagement in the world. Um, and these are just a couple of images uh, from that publication showing the kind of the work uh, that, that Knowles' students were doing and some of the studies that they were engaged in. Again, the the status of these objects between formal propositions and pure policy instruments I find really kind of staggering, uh, especially given the light that they shed on where we are um, today. You guys with me? Make sense so far? <laughs> 
deep history, it's all been done. I'm attracted to topics like landscape that have, all the ink has already been spilled. There's nothing more to be done and nobody else is working on. Um, it's my contention that um, today, I think, you know, today, I think we, in addition to the idea of harvesting energy from the sun, uh, and in parts of the world, the surfaces of buildings are becoming sufficiently equivalent to the sites of energy production that we could start there, right? And in many parts of the world, I don't know about the economy here, but in many parts of the world that I travel in, the surface of the building as a site of energy production has become quite clear and legible. And there are certain cultures that have been more aggressive about this than others, but we can talk about that. In addition to using the surfaces of buildings to collect, uh, concentrate, and distribute energy, there are at least three other tendencies you can find generally in practice today that I'll refer to. The idea of solar shading in a, in a fairly complex way, the idea of distribution or redistribution of solar uh, attributes or solar performance or solar capacity, uh, and then finally the idea of solar carving, right, shaping buildings so as to affect uh, performative outcomes. I won't spend much time on this, but there is a, like a brief history over the last two decades. This is uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, Kuwaiti Military Academy, 2010, so nine years old now, in which very detailed studies of solar performance enable a perforation pattern to choreograph the movement of cadets at the military academy in relationship to solar performance. Equally, in the Albar Towers, the idea of dynamic solar shading and response. Again, I, I'm not making great claims for these projects, but they are sufficiently embedded in contemporary practice globally as to offer something that might be generalizable. These things are no longer simply boutique or experimental. They're not done just in installation art. They're not done just in, at the scale of the, the one-off prototype. They're being done by major mainline corporate centrist firms. They're being done at large scale. We could also add to this the idea of um, towers or clusters or urban aggregations that um, either shade themselves or avoid shading themselves. You can see here the MBBJ's design 2015 of a, a no shadow tower, right? So buildings are now being choreographed so as to counter affect their shading or the shading of their uh, cohort. Or in this case, Jean Nouvel. Five years ago, Central Park in Sydney, uh, one of the larger heliostat arrays uh, built in which the heliostats, and in fact, two large arrays of heliostats bounce light into what would have been a shadowed uh, courtyard by virtue of its urban configuration. Uh, in, in the RDV in Vienna, kind of sculpting the waste. Herzog Demeron, their triangle in Paris. Again, I'm not making any great claims for any of these projects for or against. I'm just making an observation that we seem to be on the verge, on the cusp of describing a new, a new economy, a new solar economy, a new heliomorphic economy, a new heliomorphic turn in which architects and urbanists are returning to this quite, um, quite old perennial topic, let's say, with respect to solar performance. Uh, in this case, my colleague John Hong, who's now left the GSDs in Korea and working in Seoul, uh, this is 20, 2012, looking at Manhattan zoning and the idea of uh, parametric zoning envelopes. Um, for any of you that have been following uh, development on Manhattan Island, increasingly it's fair to say that tall buildings are less a vertical extrusion of property rights vertically and they're more the aggregation of view shed and bundling of parcel potential in non-linear or non-obvious ways. Um, and in this case, John Hong is extending that into a kind of urban design scaled study about what that potential might mean as an updating of the 1916 zoning ordinance. I think these tendencies can be found in a number of places around the world. I'll focus a little bit on New York just because it has a, a dense aggregation of many, many examples. I think for our purposes this evening in uh, acknowledging my indebtedness to Ralph Knowles and his work, and I think it's prescience and importance, it's no small irony that he lands in Southern California, a place that seems to have ample sunlight, <laughs> and in which the very development of the solar envelope itself uh, was maybe not as pressing as it might have been in the climates that I inhabit, the latitude that I'm coming from. But again, we might talk about that in a minute if you're interested. Uh, through the Office of Urbanization uh, with uh, our doctoral student, uh, Mariana Gomez Luque, and a couple of our research staff, we did a, um, a survey of residential buildings of a certain scale, so at the scale of the block or larger, since 2001. 
um, in which we were trying to drive something more empirical, something more synthetic, and something more collective to understand really what, what's been going on there with respect to this new solar economy. And by way of a kind of introduction to this new uh, practice, what I want to suggest is on the one hand, if you followed the work of Jean Nouvel um, on the, the MoMA site, 53rd Street, um, you see a, a process here by which he followed exactly the letter of the law, right? Exactly the 1916 zoning ordinance, its setbacks, exactly the 1961 overlay to that. And of course, Amanda Burden said, no, it's still too tall. We're taking the top off. And this is, again, without a judgment on either side of that, I don't have a dog in that hunt. What I want to say to you is that's indicative of the culture that we live in, in which all the regulation in the world produces a condition where we either want a political response and solution to things that are really spatial and formal, or we expect every project is a one-off decision, as if it had no basis on all the other projects around it. If you're interested in this, there was a, a show at the, um, the Skyscraper Museum. I don't know how many have made it to you know, Battery Park City and seen the Skyscraper Museum recently, but it does exist. And there is a, a fascinating show there that includes work um, uh, by shop and a range of other really interesting architects doing you know, tall residential buildings in Manhattan that makes this argument about view shed and bundling air rights in nonlinear ways um, that we can also take up if you want to discuss that further. Um, in this little tour of Manhattan, um, you know, Bjork Ingalls, Biggs, you know, Via building on 57th, the kind of court scraper um, is notable. Uh, it's clearly driven by heliomorphic performance in, in, in a variety of ways. Again, without making value judgments about it. Now, this may be the least serious diagram I show you this evening. I, I, I don't know what to make of this exactly. Uh, so let me just leave it at that. Um, and I don't have any basis around which to suggest that Bjarke Ingels has ever read Ralph Knowles or has met the man, so I don't want to make great claims about that. Um, but things like this, projects like this, sit in a cultural context in which um, a kind of anxiety, is the term that I'll use, has returned to our public discourse about tall buildings and their shadow. So the Municipal Arts Society has been uh, in long standing the, the guardians of our skies, let's say, um, defenders of the park. Um, and they published uh, recently the uh, Accidental Skyline Report in which um, they featured a series of diagrams and drawings illustrating the looming sh shadows of you know, so-called Billionaire's Row, these very tall, uh, very slender buildings on Central Park. Now, I'm not a landscape architect. I'm not really a tree guy. I don't know. I think there have been shadows in Central Park since Central Park has been there. I think that that's a, a natural function of parks and cities. And I particularly i am not too worked up about these very tall, very slender buildings. Um, the Skyscraper Museum show does a very interesting job of explaining when it became more profitable to leave vacant floors filled with fake and mechanical equipment so as to elevate the view shed of higher, higher floors. Um, and so the intricacies of uh, development pro formas and the logics of typology and the reproduction of capital and the value from view, I'm interested in those things. But I want to suggest that there is a broader conversation in which anxiety about shadows in the public realm has returned and that many of you are quite familiar with in your own uh, practice. Uh, it's also true that this Accidental Skyline report was published at the same moment a couple of years ago in which uh, the New York Times featured a whole series across Manhattan of rent controlled apartments that were being plunged into darkness would no longer have access to sunlight by virtue of some fairly chunky, not tall slender buildings, but fairly big kind of blockbuster, kind of middle brow kinds of things. Again, I don't want to take a position on either of those things. I want to suggest there's a debate right now, a kind of anxiety around shadow and the appropriateness of shadow. And instruments like this are being introduced into the public discourse. Uh, my colleagues are being interviewed about shadow effect on trees and the damage to the public realm. And while I don't want to minimize those concerns, it does suggest to me that the tools we have available, uh, whether they be the public fora that we have for discussing them, the media that we have available to illuminate these topics, or maybe even the language or the intellectual frameworks we have to bring to these topics seem really out of date. They seem really inadequate to the kinds of challenges that we're facing as a society. And it's in that context, I do believe this idea of a new heliomorphism or a new heliomorphic turn, it might help shed some light, if you'll let me do that. My premise is very simple. Uh, historically, the development of the urban arts, the development of urban planning, city planning in the British right to light laws and in the origins in the United States and elsewhere in the world, 
can be described along this, what I'll call an economic axis, right? That you have on the one hand, on the right, the city is a site of capital reproduction accumulation. In some ways, that may be as good a definition of urbanism as we have, right? A concentration of capital that seeks to reproduce itself. On the other hand, we have long-standing societal and legal and juridical frameworks in which we want to regulate that capacity for unfettered reproduction towards some societal goals like sunlight and air and some other things. But broad terms around that axis are terms of debate, our legal frameworks, our policy, our planning frameworks have been developed. And I won't go into the details of that, but I do believe it's fair to think about the urban arts and planning in particular as a kind of referee or as a kind of self-appointed arbiter between capital reproduction on the one hand and a kind of ethical boundary around um, basic human decency or even health or right to life. Uh, it's my assertion that I think we're on the verge of something like a new political economy with respect to the solar that I'll refer to as a biopolitical economy. And I'm illustrating here on a vertical axis that goes in a tension between the surface of the building as a site for the production of energy, which is arguably a good thing to do ecologically in most contexts, and on the other hand, the idea of limiting shadows falling in the public realm, which is arguably a very good thing to do ecologically in most contexts. I'm interested in this as a, as a razor, not only for thinking about the urban arts and our discourses, but I'm also interested in how this sheds additional light on landscape and ecology, because for too long, we've all been somehow getting over with the idea that ecology is always a good thing, and somehow burying the class and social distinctions underneath that, like whose ecology is it, who gets to decide, would be among the kinds of questions that I'm interested to ask there. And I think there's more that can be said along that axis between solar energy production and the reduction of shadow. And I'm, of course, mindful of the fact that uh, as much as any other debate we can have about the shape of the city today, this is a zero-sum game. <laughs> this is something that Ralph Knowles taught us a long time ago. We only get so much, it's finite, and we can't change that. We can't change its speed, we can't change its amount. We can only respond to it. And the way that we respond to it says a lot about us, both individually and collectively as a society. Now, this new heliomorphic practice that I'm uh, describing, it's not my idea, it's already happening. I'm simply in the luxury of the tower stepping back and trying to describe it for us so we can think about it. Can be maybe best exemplified by two recent buildings, um, also Manhattan Island, in the last uh, several years. Uh, the first is uh, by Jeannie Gang, Studio Gang Architects, um, so-called Solar Carve Tower. This is for a parcel um, uh, near the Hudson River. You can see here uh, in red, that's the site plan that's available. You can see the avenue there on the left, Hudson River at the bottom of the diagram. You can see in green the elevated high line, diagram of that. And in the outline here, you can see um, Studio Gang's drawing of the 1916 zoning ordinance. If you built the six-story plinth and then stepped back and then vanished that to the, to the vanishing point, you get a volume that looks something like that. And Jeannie would be quick to point out, when you fill it up with the pro forma that the developer can actually build for residential and condo high end on this site, you get something that looks like this. Um, in Jeannie's estimation, maybe not the most handsome volume, but following all the rules that is stepping back from the avenue, and producing an enormous amount of shadow on the High Line, amongst other sites. Uh, Studio Gang and her consultants successfully argued, and I'm led to believe by her, I think it may be true, the first project in the city to successfully argue for the reversal of the zoning ordinance to put the massing against the avenue, contravening a century or more of planning practice, precisely around the argument of removing shadow from the High Line and its associated public realm. So you see that, and then the carving, which gives the project its name, uh, shown here. Now, you will have noticed by now that it's not only the reduction of shadow on the High Line, but it's also the reduction of shadow on the yellow amenity plaza, I'm imagining that that might be. Um, and again, without making great claims about that, this is a building that was clearly articulated through an agenda about shadow reduction, and as such, occupies one end of that y-axis I showed you a moment ago, and in which um, Jeannie, as she will want to do, found a way to take that carving and use it to develop um, a kind of tectonic or a kind of spatial expression that gives the building its own unique kind of presence um, 
In that regard, uh, the idea that that building is now um, skinned, will be uh, complete shortly, um, sits you know, adjacent on the same island or nearby with this building is what's notable to me. This is the Bloomberg campus, the so-called uh, Bloomberg Center by Morphosis on um, the Cornell Tech campus on Roosevelt Island. Uh, what's notable here is less the master planning by Skidmore or my friend Jim Corner. What's maybe more important is that the first building, the old main building on this campus, the Bloomberg Center now named, was meant to, based on its pro forma, produce its own energy. It was net zero energy, and it was going to do this through an enormous array of photovoltaic panels on its roof. Now, doing this at this latitude in this climate is not trivial, but the idea that both the project's inception, Cornell Tech, but also the Bloomberg administration, ultimately Bloomberg Philanthropy, and ultimately Tom Main Morphis is committed to doing a net zero energy building is really remarkable. And the implication of that was the production of a surface for the production of solar energy, which is much larger than the building footprint itself. It's an extraordinary thing. It's a kind of amazing aircraft carrier, which does essentially the ecological good of reducing the emissions from other forms of energy production. And again, without making claims for the merit of either building, I think they're both extraordinarily talented architects. I think they've done extraordinary pieces of work in the public good. These two buildings exemplify the trade-off that I see coming on the horizon, which is we can either have the surfaces of buildings produce energy and produce enormous shadow in the public realm, especially as we go to northern latitudes, or we can reduce shadow in the public realm and in parks and in landscape spaces. And we can't do both of those things, or at least not easily, not without a series of understandings, a language, a literacy. I'm fascinated by the fact that both of these buildings were developed in the same software with the same consultants. And it was not a technological, there's nothing technological about the decision to reduce shadow or increase energy production. But the fact that there are direct formal outcomes that express themselves in the public realm, given architectonic and urban language, coming from things that were understood initially as questions of techne, I find deeply, deeply fascinating. Um, ultimately, most of this work, much of this work to date, is at the scale of buildings or campuses or small aggregations of buildings, pairs of buildings. And I think there's much more to be done to understand the collective relationships of collective urban form as we think about these uh, trade-offs. I'm equally fascinated by the fact that both Jeannie Gang and Tom Main make a very effective ethical argument about the ecological good and therefore the societal ethic of what they're doing, and yet their practices contradict each other. And that, for me, is really the crux of my message for you this evening, which is simply because we want to work in a way which is societally informed, simply because we want to work in a way which is understood and ecologically literate, doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to come to the same conclusion. We have to be prepared in an agonistic way to work through and understand there will be spaces of difference among us. There are enormous differences already, and as we apply ecological and other forms of social logic, we can't expect to all agree on these things. But at the same moment, we can't expect these kinds of responses and the quality of design that they engender to come simply from the reproduction of capital, unfettered or uncritically mitigated through, in this case, a heliomorphic lens or more broadly, an ecological lens. It's also, for me, fascinating that when I approached Tom and Jeannie very excitedly a couple of years about these observations. They both said they learned it from Ralph Knowles. Tom Main, of course, was a student here, right, on this very campus of Ralph Knowles. And what he tells me, what Tom Main tells me about that experience is that everything he learned about architecture, he learned from Ralph. Now, Tom can tell a good story. Nobody wants to undersell a good Tom Main story. Um, but what I understood from that was in the Natural Forces Laboratory and then the studio, what Tom Main understood was taking a single parameter to unreasonable limits toward formal expression. And I think that's a fair way of explaining the Bloomberg Center campus uh, building at Cornell Tech. But I also think it's a way of understanding uh, the impact of Ralph Knowles as an educator. When I had a similar conversation with my friend Jeannie Gang, I mentioned this to her. She said, after leaving OMA and her apprenticeship there over many years, she moved back to Chicago the first person that she came to interview in the US was Ralph Knowles. Because they both understood Tom for a long time and Jeannie for a long time, that his work was quite prescient in that regard. Um, and I think 
you, he's your Ralph Knowles, you, you know him better than I, but I do want to suggest that um, there are roles in which institutions like ours play, not just in education, not just in role modeling, but also in providing a space for a kind of research which wouldn't be supported by the simple mechanics of capital. And so again, touching on the theme of the lecture series in capital, one of our fiduciary interests in our calling, in our line of work, is not to be illiterate or unconcerned or unempathetic about the fact that we live in a capitalist society, but at the same moment to understand there are spaces like this one, even though we are ir irrigated in capital, in which we create a space, we call it a laboratory or a studio, in which the primary intellectual and the primary educational logic is not one of capital. And that ultimately for me is one of the key lessons that I've tried to take away from Ralph Knowles and the Natural Forces Lab. And I think many of us share in spite of the fact that we work in different ways on different sites and different uh, subject matter. So over the last year and a half, uh, my team and I, uh, we've been working to try to develop, um, to fill that gap that I described as collective urban outcomes. What does it mean to try to look collectively, right? Now that we have tools that are available, we, we see these practices around the world, and that there are some broader societal and ecological questions that remain uh, to be answered. And so very naively, we started um, a couple of years ago just looking again at the kind of Ur project of Manhattan you know, planning and trying to understand the 1916 zoning ordinance from the inside and developing one of the kinds of uh, work that we do that we, we refer to as um, relational urban modeling. Right? So you, you might think of this as parametric or relational modeling in which we're studying um, urban form relative to certain ecological performance drivers. So in this case, we take the 1916 uh, zoning ordinance and the kind of prototypical or Ur Manhattan block with its avenues and streets and its set-asides and its, its, its uh, setbacks. And we try to apply a kind of maximum FAR reduction of shadow or increase of solar energy performance. Let's say if we did solar car or if we did Blue Brook Center across urban form collectively to try to understand what would be the implication of that. Just again, very naively, very obviously, just using both you know, digital and material terms to understand what would the shape of the city be? What might be possible in this kind of collective urban form? Uh, and again, without making great claims for this kind of work, we're building a kind of repertoire, a kind of language a way of working, workflow, but also a kind of sensibility and a kind of a set of intellectual frameworks, let's say, for thinking about the shape of the city over time. These studies uh, we produced over the course of 2017. And then in 2018, my friend Mark Lee and Sharon Johnson invited us to join their curation of the Chicago Biennial. So in the New York work, we were benefiting from the fact that, you know, we all have kind of etched in our retinas in schools of architecture, you know, Manhattanism, right? In some ways, it's, it's a kind of cheat code. It's a kind of language with which we can telegraph very quickly.